Hey, it's Cody, Keepers of Nerdum. Thought I would make a random video today. I'm actually on the road back home, traveling a little bit. But I think it'd be fun to talk for a minute about one of my favorite shows ever and do a quick review and ranking of Star Trek shows. Star Trek is one of the best, hands down, sci-fi shows around. I mean, Star Wars definitely has its place for sure in a lot of people's hearts, and I totally get it, and I love it too. But Star Trek is that thing that is a mind, it's a mind thing that, that you appreciate and you get to think about, and that's, that's the beauty of it. And Star Trek has existed for decades and decades now, and it just keeps going. Sometimes it falters and it fails, and I think right now we're actually in an interesting point of Star Trek, where there's both really, really good and really, really not good, but I think it'd be fun to, to walk through each of the shows a little bit. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to watch each of these shows. If you're a true Trekkie, I'm sure you've seen just about everything. There's actually a few things recently I haven't seen just because of CBS All Access. I've, I've watched a few of the beginnings of some of those shows, but I haven't gotten to see everything yet. So I will do some rating on some of that and just be honest with some of it I haven't seen everything of yet. So first off, we have the original series that started back in the 60s with James T. Kirk, William Shatner, you know, and we had Spock with Leonard Nimoy and the rest of the, the cast and crew who were just fantastic, really. Um, it is, for its time, a fantastic show. Honestly, one of the saddest things I ever saw was when they replaced the original Enterprise in the uh, special editions and the stuff that's on CBS All Access and wherever else now with a CGI Enterprise because it just, it just doesn't look very good. It was kind of cheap CGI. But overall, it's, it's a good show because it, it really was a... T a show of the future for the era that it was in. And that's always the interesting thing is seeing shows that portray the future based on the era that they exist in. And the original series really is one of those that it really was trying to push the boundaries on some things. Ironically, it was trying to be equality and things like that, but yet then have mini skirts and things like that too. It, it didn't quite make a lot of sense, but... It, it, it was fun to see that they were trying to push the envelope of, hey, maybe there's something better. And that was Gene Roddenberry's dream, even though, you know, he wasn't always the easiest person to work with. He had that dream. And so the original series, it, it's hard for a lot of people to watch today if they didn't grow up on it. But it is it is something special. And even the worst episodes, they're special. You know, Spock's brain is special. That's for sure. Um... The next show that we had after that was The Next Generation. Everybody thought that would fail because how do you how do you come after Captain Kirk and Spock and them? How do you succeed at that? And Patrick Stewart was rumored to not even unpack his suitcase for several weeks because he just thought it was going to fail. And truth be told, that first season, I'm shocked it didn't fail because the, the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation is... It's rough. It's definitely rough. But the show itself is so good because it's the exact same kind of thing of dealing with social issues, dealing with things that that might really hit you where your, your current situation is at but through a future lens. And that's that's something beautiful that, that they did and it was so fascinating and it got better and better and better and as the actors got more comfortable in, in who they were it became more interesting honestly that show has my favorite character in all of Star Trek of Data uh, Brent Spiner just plays that to a T which is funny that a comedian could play a straight laced person like that so well um, but the one thing is that the next generation was still doing was episodic just one episode at a time essentially or maybe two parters in between seasons and it was just that was it there was no like serial story there wasn't a longer story to tell and that that unfortunately you know it was it was a thing of the times but once they finally got to this idea we could tell longer stories 
that became something really interesting. And unfortunately, Star Trek struggles through that, trying to do individual episodes because it, it worked for the original series. So the Next Generation did it, and and it does work, and it's it's fine. But you also don't get as much character development and continuous story and drama. Um, the next show that came out really broke that was Deep Space Nine, and you know there's always these rumors that it that it was a copy and paste of Babylon 5 and if you watch Babylon 5 there's a lot of similarities like they, you would be hard pressed to convince me that there wasn't some copy and paste there but amazing amazing show at first it's slow it is so slow because they're just on a space station and there's not a whole lot happening and it is just episode at a time and eventually they, they went you know what we're going to go with bigger story arcs. My understanding is one of the, the main producers left to work on another Star Trek show, and that's when I believe they they changed things up. I can't remember for sure on those details, but they, they did have someone leave, and then it allowed them to do more. And so they decided, let's go into a full-on war, because what does the Federation look like, a peaceful organization, when war is on them? And that's fascinating, because that's, that's a tough subject. And man, so good. Uh, Benjamin Sisko is just such a good captain and or you know commander at the beginning of the show. He just he just plays so well. Um, oh my goodness, I cannot remember the actor's name right now off the top of my head. But he is he's so good. I enjoy him so much. Uh, Miles O'Brien being back is great. Jadzia Dax is fantastic. Uh, yeah, man. Honestly, the best character in that whole show, though, is probably Rom for me. Rom just cracks me up because he's not a normal Ferengi. He's he actually just cares. Mommy. And it's funny seeing his brother hate him for just being not normal for a Ferengi. But it, it's good. It's it's just such a good show. And then honestly, it has some of the best episodes in all of Star Trek in many ways. Uh, Trials and Tribulations, where they go back in time and get inserted into the original series episode, the Trouble with Tribbles, is so good because they, they make it look believable. And then the episode where Cisco actually talks essentially to the audience about what he did to get the Romulans into the Dominion War, just so powerful and so good, and they, they did it so well. Uh, that is That is a fantastic show. It wasn't my favorite growing up, but as I as I've watched it more and more, I've realized how good it was. Also, the Ferengi episode where they try to rescue Moogie is epic, epic. The other one, right after that, was Star Trek Voyager, and for years and years, this is actually one of my favorite shows. Even though, it really, when you come down to think about it, when you're an adult, you realize it's not very good because. The show would have been way more interesting if the Voyager was struggling and hurting a lot and was a mess and didn't didn't have what it needed. And instead, it oftentimes is pretty happy-go-lucky. And then there's the occasional episodes where they'll actually show what it really would have been like, like the Year of Hell, Part One and Two, I believe. But as a kid, I, I love the idea of this is a Federation ship with ideals that now they can't really uphold fully, and so. It's, it's tough to see them try to figure that out. And honestly, the, uh, the fa- my favorite episodes, and I think it's a lot of people's, is the Equinox Part 1 and 2. Because Equinox Part 1 and 2 really just hit home that question of Federation ideals when you're off on your own. And the Nova-class starship that was supposed to be the Defiant from Deep Space Nine is just a beautiful little ship. Um, man. Uh, you know... I think that's the interesting thing is Voyager also, you know, it had some of the most interesting characters again. You know, Star Trek has a really good job of usually having great characters and Catherine Janeway was a great captain for us to, to see finally as a the, the, the female lead. Uh, Kate Mulgrew just knocks it out of the park. Um, Robert Picardo, I got to see him once at a convention thing and just, he plays the doctor so well. And it's funny because he would have been more than likely for many a person that nobody would have cared about, but yet Robert Ricardo took that, made it his own, and because of that, people realized how popular he was. You know, 
709 was always the eye candy for people when she showed up. And she was, for me, it was more she was an interesting character of exploring a Borg drone that's trying to reintegrate to being a human again. I think that's fascinating. The, uh, I think the biggest negative actually for me for Voyager is oftentimes the miracles that they would pull out of their butts for medical stuff. Like I get the holographic doctor has is, is got access to all knowledge, but holy cow, some of the things that he would he would do and just be like, he just reverse things that you go, okay, I know you're in the future and you have science and medical that's, that we don't quite understand, but that person's literally a flipping lizard. There's no way you're just turning them back into human and everything's fine. Like that, that's, that's not how this works. But you know, that's that's one of those things as you grow up, you realize there's some, some problems. Uh, the next show that came out was Star Trek Enterprise. And very quickly, it became one of my favorite shows because, you know, showing the Starfleet before the Federation was actually formed was fascinating. And they have some of the technology, but not all of it. Sometimes the, the biggest gripe you could really say with that was sometimes they would all of a sudden have technology that they really shouldn't get. Because I, I was really looking forward to a very rustic, barely there warp five ship that, that can do a few things. You know, transporters are just on the cusp of barely functioning at all. And they, they kind of sounded like that at first, but then very quickly it's like, no, nah, they work. You know, and, and just that idea of everything just not being quite there. I love the episode where they finally have to go back to Earth to get rearmed because they realize they don't have the capabilities to really defend themselves out there. That's that's like the one of the good times where it really explores the idea that no, this ship is not ready for this. But the first two seasons, they're really, really, they're they're good of Enterprise, but they're very just single individual episodes at a time, going back to that that formula. And Voyager did that too a lot, but in season three they decided to do a full season story arc, and at the time I hated it because I wasn't able to watch all of it, so I was really confused, but whenever it finally came out on like Netflix and other streaming services, wow, that was good, because we actually got to see a show give us a full story, and that's season three, a story arc is really good, but then season four, they got an extra bonus season. And season four is, for the most part, a love letter to Star Trek. And the very last episode of that is supposed to be a love letter, but it's it turned out very, very poorly. But that whole last season, other than the very last episode, is it's just fantastic because it answers questions. It, it kind of delves into some of the history. You know, like, it, it even answers the question of why do Klingons not have bridges in the original series? Like, they actually give some not great answer, but at least an answer to that, that question. And ironically, I would really have a really frustrating time because I'll get to that in a second of this, but that Klingons having ridges all of a sudden. But the thing was, it was actually changed in the original series movies that they all of a sudden have ridges. And so even though they were in the movies rather than the show, and it was a budget thing, they just couldn't do it at the time to make them look more alien. Just a simple truth is, it was still in the original series that the change was made, so inside the same original continuity, that show was made. Oh, I forgot. There is also the animated series. Um, I've watched through, I think, all of that. Uh, it's fun. You know, it just kind of feels like continuations of episodic little stories of Star Trek, the original series, and it's fun. Uh, just, that's that's all I've got to say. Uh, you know, watch those if you like the original series. Because they're, they're just neat. But they're kind of a little side note. Uh, but yeah, Enterprise answers some of that stuff. It just has some of these amazing, amazing little story arcs where you even get to see Brent Spiner show up. And and it makes sense. It's not just really. There's no way he's alive. But it, it's actually amazing. Um, very good show. And then we kind of had a hiatus after that because they were kind of nervous about Star Trek because Enterprise didn't do as well as they were hoping. And... To be fair, I, I think it was some of the things that they did around it, because the first two seasons didn't draw people in. Um, it was also around that time with like Battlestar Galactica, where things were getting darker and more, uh, 
intense and like Battlestar Galactica, like the entire show is basically one big story arc rather than each episode just being a little bottle. Although occasionally that would happen where you could skip an episode and it wouldn't matter. But uh, eventually they finally came out with some other shows and the, the, most, the first one was Star Trek Discovery. The idea of stuff before, slightly before Kirk's time, just a little bit before, and quite frankly, that show, I've watched the first two seasons, I've seen some reviews and walkthroughs of some of the third season stuff, and it was just because I couldn't get access to CBS All Access at the moment, but the first two seasons, man, the second season was way better, but the first season was just a mess. The Klingons do not look like Klingons. Their technology is crazy advanced compared to the original series. Their... It looks... That, that's the thing. It, it looks beautiful. Like, the show is very, very visually stunning. Honestly, the ships that they show would have been perfect, a lot of them, for TNG era and beyond with just a few small updates. And some of them, not even that. Like, they're, they're, they're perfectly fine. And you could have shown some sort of war. You could have shown the stuff that you're doing. No big deal. But unfortunately, they, they went in this, this era before even Kirk's time. And they also... There's, there's this modern thing that they're doing where we have to have certain roles and characters be filled with certain people. And that, unfortunately, causes some interesting... Uh, just problems. Sorry, I happened to get over in another lane and watch for stuff. Uh, well, let's just let's just cut to it. There, there's this thing right now of female leads having to be. I'm better. Keep left oh. to stay on I-65 North. Follow signs for I-40 West, Memphis. We'll do, Alexa. All right, but the, the female leads have to be in control, but not just in control, like, better than everyone else, and, you know, the, the simple fact is, Star Trek had an amazing female lead in Catherine Janeway, and she was so good, so good, because she commanded authority and respect, but she didn't talk down to everyone, like, she showed what true equality would look like, and, and it was beautiful, like, it was really cool, and so when they introduced, like, Michael Burnham, it just doesn't it doesn't work and it comes across as just arrogant and then boastful and proud and then you've got a problem of people don't like your main character and then unfortunately there seems like there's this label of well you're just this or this but really it's it's just we've already seen good versions of that we saw that in Catherine Janeway and we saw it in Rachel Garrett Rachel Garrett, honestly, for even just the one episode she was in, like, I want to know more about her. I want to watch a show about her. I want to see an ep a show about her and the Enterprise scene. That would have been awesome. And unfortunately, they didn't take advantage of that right then and there because, man, do I need to still... And so, just, just keep that in mind that it's not that... Don't, like lead women, no, it's, they have to just do it right, you know, if you have a boastful, arrogant character as your lead, it's just not going to work, it's going to be frustrating, now, if you have a boastful, arrogant character that they then explore and flesh out and, and give different things, like, I, I think back to the doctor that Robert Ricardo plays, there is an arrogance there, and at first you go, oh, he's so frustrating, and finally, after the reality of he gets freedom, he starts to mellow out, and you start to realize that there's things he needs to figure out. And when he actually gets told, "Hey, you need to stop that," and he gets it, like that's that's a learning, and it's good. Um, that's those are powerful things. So, uh, Discovery Discovery had a lot of issues. Season two was better, and the character they got to play Pike and Number One, they were very, very good. Uh, Spock was kind of hit or miss at times, but uh, it's just not a show that I would really truly recommend to a true blue Trekkie. If you want a lot of action and adventure, I guess, but 
it's just it's just wrong. And honestly, the biggest thing that got me really frustrating before I even watched the show was that the Klingons didn't even look like Klingons. I was like, those those Zindi, they look more like a Zindi race of some sort than a Klingon. And just weird, just weird. Uh, the the next show that they, if I remember right, was Picard. And so far, they've got a season of that out. Another season on the way. Uh, Star Trek Picard is, you know, following his story a little bit later, but unfortunately, it kind of falls victim to that same issue with the, the Michael Burnham character that a lot of the female characters in the show talk down to him, even though they acknowledge as they're talking down to him, like, you saved, like, tons and tons of people. You you did your job, and we just didn't want you here anymore. So we hate you. It, it just doesn't it just doesn't work at times. But seeing Patrick Stewart and some of the other original or the Next Generation characters show up again, those are neat. But there are times where the story doesn't quite make as much sense as it should. So it, it it's not a terrible show, but it's it's definitely a show that's got some problems to say the least and it, it definitely I, I don't think Gene Roddenberry would be too excited from Discovery of Picard I think in fact he'd be pretty upset and I don't know how he'd feel about the next show but I, I'm intrigued and I still want to watch it and so that's that's my one thing I, I haven't gotten to see the show yet but I really do want to is the Star Trek Lower Decks animated series and you know it's comedy but it's also, some people mocked it for, the oh, Star Trek would never let this happen. I'm like, oh, uh, you apparently haven't watched a lot of Star Trek because the simple truth is there's going to be a ship or two out there in this this world. Just keep straight. Yep. Okay. There's going to be ships in, in Starfleet that aren't quite as good as the flagship that they send people to just finish out their time and go back to civilian life. You know, it, it makes me think of the Voyager episode where they, they Janeway deals with the people down in the lower decks of the ship that they would have been reassigned for just being incompetent or, you know, not, not being able to do their jobs very well or wanting to do something else. But since they're halfway across the galaxy, they can't. But... The idea that there is a ship out there, or two, or ten, <laughs> that aren't quite as up to snuff as the rest, I love that, because that gives you the simplicity of, there are ships in the fleet that, they're not the flagship, and that's where the failures and the dropouts that are almost on their way out of Starfleet go, this is kind of their last ditch effort, and so... I'm intrigued, and I want to watch all of it and, and see it, and, I'm, you know, I'm excited for something like that because I think that's that's a simple truth in Star Trek that if you pay attention to even the original series and TNG, there are ships dying and blowing up all over the place, and you go, okay, were they bad at their job? Were they just the best that they could be and just happen to still fail? You know, and that, that's the interesting question is, like, which one is it? And sometimes I think it's it's one or the other. Sometimes it's maybe a little mix of both that some people on the ship weren't as good as they needed to be. You know, because the Enterprise makes it out, but those ships didn't. So it's a good it's a good thing to actually explore this idea of what, what happens on a terrible ship. <laughs> a terrible ship that barely holds together because their crew is all over the place. I think that's a great question that should always be explored at some point. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Now, rating the stuff. One thing I would say is if you've never watched Star Trek, you'd probably find the original series is probably the hardest of all of them to watch, period. And maybe the animated series right along with it. And I totally get that. Just because it's, it's old... It doesn't hold up very well to stuff now. I will say, one of the best things about the original series that not everybody can appreciate, but it's usually the last, like, two, three minutes where usually Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are sitting around the captain's chair having a little, uh, 
kind of like a summary meeting. And they always just have this little digs at each other or comments about what just happened. And usually there's a little smirk, right, as the show cuts away. It's just a neat little thing that they did back then. But just keep in mind, you know, I, I unfortunately... I think that's the case for a lot of people that they would see that as the worst of the worst just because of the age of it. But for me personally, the rankings I would have is the bottom, the very bottom would have to be uh, Discovery. Discovery is not, it's just not what Star Trek is. And here's the other thing. We had a show that was more Star Trek than Discovery was happening at the same time, and that was the Orville. And I'm looking forward to that show as it keeps going because that show is just fantastic. Because it's doing what Star Trek did. Having the individual little episodes that dealt with issues of the day, like our current day, but in a futuristic tone. And it's bright and happy, but then there's some serious story arcs that are tough. But yet they're still portrayed as we're trying to be the good guys and trying to figure it out. And the Orville is so good. And I mean, honestly, I could almost put it in the rankings because it's... It's more Star Trek than Discovery is. It, it just doesn't line up with how Star Trek works. Um, anyway, after that for rating, uh, I'd probably say Picard. Not because it's terrible or anything, just just not as good as some of the rest. The next one above that would be, oh man, oh man. See, this is where it gets really hard. I have a I have a deep love and appreciation for all the rest of the shows. Probably the animated series right here, just because it doesn't like make a whole lot of extension of stuff, other than the Cations are a thing now, and that's something in Lower Decks. So I'd say the animated series and Lower Decks somewhere in here. Uh, there's man, it's so hard because I would have to probably say right after that. I'm not going to lie, the original series may be right there. Again, not because it's bad, it's just i got to put something else above it. Uh, I love it a lot. Uh, Deep Space Nine's right there after that. And then TNG and Voyager at this point are almost tied for me. They're just both so good. And lastly, I would say definitely has to be Enterprise for me. It's, it's everything I want in a show. It's got great story. It's got interesting characters. I, that's one thing I didn't talk about. Let's let's talk about that for just a second. We have Captain Archer, who is a fantastic captain. I, I love the actor. I'm drawing a blank right now. Scott Bakula. So good. He's from Team Lewis. Yeah. Uh, Jolene Blaylock, the place to Paul. Fantastic. She does a Vulcan so well. Man, Trip is so good. Now, there's some stinkers of characters, let's be honest. Uh, Malcolm Reed, boring. Very boring. Hoshi Sato, you just feel like she's just whiny a lot. It's sad. And then she gets the uh, In a Mirror Darkly episodes, and it's really fun to see her shine. Uh, Mayweather, again, not a character that has a whole lot of story at times. And when he does get some story, then it makes it fun. But then the my, my favorite character, it's something about the Doctors in most of these Star Trek shows, they, they do a really good job with, because every single character, every single Doctor in the Star Trek series that I've seen has typically been interesting. Uh, I think Discovery is the one that wasn't as interesting. But, you know, even TNG had one of Season 2 with uh, Pulaski. Not, she wasn't very good, but it was interesting to see that just difference. But, you know, we've had McCoy, we've had the Doctor, we've had uh, Beverly Crusher, we've had Julian Bashir. And Julian was funny because he wasn't a very good character, and then they changed him up a little bit later on. And my personal favorite, though, is Phlox. Because Phlox was a different Doctor that he's got alien medicine. <laughs> and so half the time he's just got a menagerie of animals that he uses that have essentially, like homebrew remedy things that actually work and he's they've studied on his home world and just his culture and his species were fascinating and I, I love seeing everything about him and as a side note that's one of the best 
one of my favorite episodes in the Orville is whenever Robert Ricardo and uh, the, the person who plays Phlox have an episode together in the Orville. And it's so funny. It's just it's just good because they they knew they knew who they had. And they're like we're gonna we're gonna go hog hog wild with this. But Enterprise is just that discovery, trying to learn things, trying to form the Federation. I love seeing that. So good, and it, it truly has just a great cast. And I don't know, just a just a neat show that really truly was trying to answer a few little questions, have some fun in between, and they, they did some amazing things with it. You know, sometime I'll try to review the Star Trek movies, because, man, there's that's a whole other thing, but I think that's where my rankings would be. There's a lot of them that are just straight up right in the middle, because they're just all good for different reasons. But, yeah, I would say definitely the bottom is, is Discovery, and the top for me is Enterprise. But, what is your favorite Star Trek show, and what's your least, and why? I'd love to hear it, because I, I think that's fascinating to have the discussion of what is it that, that gets you interested in Star Trek and, and what's kept you there. So, I've been Cody, one of the keepers of Nerddom, and I will talk to you later. Bye.